Hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Herbert. How are you? How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Right. How's good everything? To see you. How is your family? Very, very, very good. Very good. Great. Yeah. It's, it's getting in. Yeah, how's everything with you? Fine. 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 The weather has been perfect. Pardon? No. Okay. Let's um, share our screen. Yeah. Let's see uh, if anybody has any questions before we start. I see. Hmm. Good. Can you all hear me? Yeah. You're fine. Okay. We were, uh, last time we were examining the issue of flatness in discrete time nonlinear systems, systems uh, described by by a difference, nonlinear difference equation of this sort with the control input. And we had to find a flat output as a, as a special output. In this uh, instance, we allow it to be only a function of the state X, such that all the states are parameterizable in terms of that output and a finite number of advances. And also the control input is parameterizable in terms of that flat output and the number of advances in a finite manner. That's usually called a difference parameterization. So some authors allow for the use of arbitrary uh, delays and advances at the same time uh, in regards to the influence of that flat output in the definition of the control or the state. That, that is uh, in some way masking dynamical feedback linearization. And this, the reason why we don't introduce it that way is that the first step in my belief is to study the simplest case and the simplest case is static feedback linearization. And uh, for that reason, we, we only allow the flat output to be a function of the of the state alone. And that the difference parameterization has to be in terms of pure advances and not to include delays, past values of the flat output in the definition of, of flatness. And we, we gave a, a very simple example in which uh, a discrete time model of a so-called buck converter uh, setting the sampling time to one unit of time in a normalized manner, it gives you this linear equation. In this linear equation, we see that already one of the states qualifies as the flat output. This state, which is the output voltage, qualifies as the flat output because the input current X1 can be written in terms of the flat output alone from uh, by solving from this equation. So X1 is just a function of the flat output and one of its advances. And of course, X2 coincides with the flat output in this case. It is not always the case that state as a particular state variable or the system output qualifies as a flat output. 
a special case. But in the, in the event that that happens, there is no difficulty and there is no uh, special consideration. So X1 and X2 are parametrizable in terms of Y and YK plus one. And, um, and from there, uh, the, the control input can now be placed also in terms of the flat output and a number of advances because X1 is already uh, parametrizable in terms of Y. X2 is just Y itself. Therefore, the control can be written in terms of the parametrized uh, expression involving the Y, the flat output, and a finite number of, um, of its advances. So it's very natural to have this sort of inverse map in which every aspect of the state space is written in terms of a variable that in this case has a quite significant physical meaning. And that, uh, that meaning is uh, just this, the, the output voltage of the system. So flat output allows you to explore all the properties of the state variables in terms of a particular uh, a special output. And, uh, and the input-output relation is automatically obtained from, the, from that uh, relationship. So for instance, um, equilibrium. Equilibrium can be readily obtained from, from these expressions by letting y become an equilibrium value, let's say y bar. Uh, y bar then is one over Q times, uh, X one is one over Q times Y bar. And, and in that way, you have a relation with, with somebody uh, that allows you to plan trajectories in a simple way. If I wanted to control X one rather than X two, then I would be able to, to see the equilibria and see how to reach that equilibrium in order to guarantee the control objective. If on the contrary, X2 is what you need to control, then directly whatever you do with Y, you're gonna be doing with, with, um, with the output voltage. Therefore, it is a, it's an analysis tool uh, for exploring properties and it's also, um, it's also a, a design tool. For instance, suppose you, you allow X1 to go to a constant value. If, y, if, if X1 goes to a constant value, this would be a stable dynamics. And it would be stable because this eigenvalue associated with the dynamics of Y is already smaller than one. Therefore, we can conclude from here that X1 is minimum phase. So the, the properties of each state variable allows you to, to be uh, assessed and inferred from this parametrization. It's a, it's a parametrization in terms of something which is important in the system, and therefore it should help you in establishing fundamental properties of the, of the uh, control objective or to clarify whether the, the maneuver is, is feasible or not. If this variable were non-minimum phase, then I, I know I will have difficulties in controlling X1 to a certain value. But, uh, but X2 offers no, no difficulty because X2 doesn't have any zero dynamics or any remaining dynamics. It's just a static relationship with one of the states in this case, in this particular case. So it's an analysis and, and a design tool. And that, um, that uh, should be useful. Uh, in, in the general case, when you have, uh, when you have uh, the nonlinear system, we would qualify the, the flat output, which is a nonlinear function of the state, as that output which has relative degree n. Recall that the actual flat, the actual output, the, the natural output of the system might not be uh, relative degree n. Recall that the flat output is, is an endogenous output that you either compute from the structure of your system or you find out by inspection 
that uh, certain combination of the states might be linear or nonlinear gives you the desired property of being relative degree n. So the flat output is, is uh, relative degree n, and for that we resorted to the definition of relative degree. And in that case, all the advances of the output are independent of the control input, and therefore uh, only the last advance in the, in the allowable dimensional order of the system, which is n, uh, he has a, a, a dependence on the control input by reflecting that this partial derivative is not identically zero as in the previous advances of the output. So this, this output is relative degree n, and that will be tantamount to flatness because all the properties uh, uh, that we are demanding on the flat output will be satisfied by a particular output which has relative degree n. So we call that a flat output and we say that the whole system is flat when such an output exists. And um, let me allow some more people that are getting in. So let's, let's examine the nature of, of, of that map. The, the, uh, the nonlinear output and its finite number of advances all the way up to n minus one are only functions of the state. And, uh, and it's very easy to prove as we, as, as I believe we already did in the relative degree R case, all the gradients of these nonlinear maps are independent. They are linearly independent. All the gradients of, of these maps are linearly independent. If, if there were some linear dependence, then the, the, there is a contradiction in the definition of the relative degree n that we, that we are assuming that is valid for the flat out. So this map is an invertible map. In, in fact, we call this the observability map because it entitles the output map in a nonlinear fashion and all the composition of the output map with the next state map in order to create um, a set of uh, functionally independent scalar uh, variables that qualify as, uh, as a state coordinate transformation. All the gradients being completely independent of each other gives this nonlinear map the possibilities of being, uh, somebody's writing on the, on my screen, uh, the possibilities of being a state coordinate transformation. So the proposition is very simple. A, a system of, of this sort is flat if and only if this map for the particular H that satisfies this property of being relative degree N, if, if, this, uh, if this map of scalar functions um, is full rank. That's, that's equivalent to flatness and that's equivalent to relative degree n. And uh, one of the demands that we had on the flat output is that they cannot satisfy by themselves um, equations, difference equations. Uh, the flat output cannot be autonomous in the sense that some combination, linear or nonlinear, of these variables would produce a difference equation that doesn't require the presence of any system variable, but that uh, let's say uh, this would be uh, the variables that naturally appear in an autonomous system. That cannot happen. If that happens, why is not a flat output? And um, so we're going to to show this proposition that that the full rank of this map is equivalent to flatness because all the properties of flatness are satisfied uh, for y. And um, the, the, the proof is very simple. Let's, let's assume, first of all, that the system is flat. So, uh, so assuming that h of x is a flat output, then by definition, the flat output cannot, sat cannot satisfy any difference equation. That means that the element in, in this column vector are uh, independent, are functionally independent, and uh, therefore the gradients are, are linearly independent. 
Therefore, it follows that the Jacobian matrix of OX is full rank. If the Jacobian matrix of this map is full rank, is because the map is, is, uh, is full rank. If the Jacobian matrix has linearly independent row vectors, then this map is full rank locally. And therefore, uh, one of the, of the implications of the proposition is satisfied. If the system is flat, then uh, all these uh, functions are independent of each other and they exhibit linearly independent gradients. And uh, the, the uh, suppose now that uh, that map, the observability map, is full rank, but uh, at the same time we, we assume that Y is, is not itself independent. So th this means that one can solve for each one of the components of the state vector in terms of Y, because being full rank, it means that since all these are only a function of xk and no control input appears here from the assumption of relative degree n, then we can solve for xk in terms of, of all these uh, advances of, sorry, advances of the, of the output y sub k. Therefore, xk enjoys a difference parametrization with respect to that variable uh, yk. And um, if you give a, a, a further shift to that, you will surely hit the control because all of those advances of the output uh, will be, uh, will be, this would be a different. Uh, all, all the advances of the output will be independent of you, but the nth one will be, um, will be uh, dependent of you. If that is not the case, and as we're assuming, then uh, this would also have to be equal to zero. And that would mean that yk plus n evolves without any uh, presence of y. Therefore, y is an autonomous element because y and a finite number of, of its advances satisfy a, a difference equation which is totally independent of the only other variable that I have to watch for, which is the control input. And that, that is a contradiction because, because uh, that, that violates the independence of the Y. So um, if, uh, if, if, the, if this equality is not valid and this is different from zero, then the implicit function theorem tells you that in that advance, you can locally solve for the control input. And the control input would be solvable in terms of the state and the next state. But since, this, since the state in the previous definition was computable in terms of, of Y and its advances, then the control input is also computable in terms of Y and its advances including one more advance for the output that is required for the state. That means that the system is differentially flat, is difference flat and therefore why is a flat output. So this, this theorem or this proposition is very simple in the sense that establishes the way that the, pro, the basic property that one should look for in order to establish the flat output. The flat output would be a particular output of the system, which is only a function of the state, such that the, the advances of that flat output all the way to n minus one, where n is the order of the system, have to be uh, a function of the state alone. That means y has to be relative degree n. And uh, the dependence with the control input is, is, is forceful for the next advance of this output. Otherwise, y would be a totally independent variable that evolves by itself and cannot be controlled. And in that, in that manner, the whole system is equivalent to that because that map would be uh, an invertible map. Therefore, uh, we have a characterization of flat output, which is uh, easy to, to, to assess by inspection. One looks for, in the first place, one looks for a state variable that satisfies the property of being able to compute absolutely every variable in the given system. 
and by that we mean every one of the states and the control input also. So knowing the flat output allows you to know everything that is inside the system and the relation that that output has with the control input. In that, in that uh, respect, it's a complete examination of all the relevant issues surrounding the definition of the system, states and inputs. And of course, if the system happens to have a natural output, which is not the flat output, that natural output is also parametrizable in terms of the states and possibly the inputs, and therefore is parametrizable in terms of the flat output. So the canonical form for, for a flat system uh, requires no additional variables or complementary variables to describe the, the complete n-dimensional system. Only the particular output and its advances will be enough to, to obtain a complete description of the system and that description will happen to be linear because the, the flat output and its advances are obviously related by this chain of, uh, of single advances or this chain of, of uh, delays uh, all relating the output of the system to the input of the system. So the, the relation between the actual input is, is fundamentally a linear ladder of uh, elementary relations all the way to, towards the output. And um, because the system is relative degree n, this nonlinearity appearing here in terms of the transform variables uh, will be a function of the control. But because this function has a, a partial derivative with respect to u, which is different from zero thanks to the relative degree assumption, that means that this nonlinear function can be solved in terms of u when you uh, substitute the whole expression by an auxiliary control input V. So this nonlinear relation is invertible in terms of U. U can be computed in terms of the, uh, of the entire state uh, vector and the auxiliary input V and vice versa. Uh, v is computable, of course, in terms of the state vector and the control input. Therefore, the system is exactly linear. This state coordinate transformation represented by this invertible map is the state coordinate transformation. That means it is a static procedure uh, which allows you to write down the equations in terms of a linear system provided you redefine your control input in this manner. This redefinition is like a partial state feedback with the possibilities of continuing the control of the system through a new auxiliary control input variable V sub K. But the essence is that now you have, without any approximation, you have a perfectly linear system on which your preferred design methodology can be applied in order to regulate the output of the system C1K, which is just YK. So this regulating this flat output allows you to play around with the desired values of the state because this flat output is, is in a one-to-one -one relation to all the states through the advances uh, cast in this uh, nonlinear map. Therefore, any control objective placed on the original state variables or on the original output uh, can be translated uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion to objectives uh, which, are, which are imposed on the flat output and its advances. Uh, and and this, this output vector contains all those advances. Therefore, the, the, the control problem is, is somehow trivialized to regulating a perfectly linear system, at least in a local fashion. Yes, Professor Gao. Uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, for your um, introduction to this uh, concept. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, is feedback linear variable a necessary and sufficient condition 
for the system to be flat. Is, is this a, a repeat the question? Didn't get you. By, by definition, by definition, ah. is the um, uh, feedback linear variable uh, <clears throat> a uh, necessary and uh, sufficient condition for the system to be flat? Feedback linearization in this case, in this case, which is single input, single output, flat output, depending only on the states, feedback linearization is equivalent to flatness. Okay. Okay. Uh, my, my second question is, uh, if you have a delay, say you have a delay of L, so in this equation, instead of U of K, you have U of K minus L. Yeah. Well, in the case yeah. of in the case of delay uh, systems for delay discrete time systems, uh, the delay is somehow irrelevant in the sense that the state, the control input itself, through some advances, can create new states, and uh, and therefore an extended system is obtained which has no delays. Okay. That that's what uh, that's what I was. Uh, I think you mentioned that before. I just want to confirm that. So you so so you can expand this equation to include the delays as uh, a uh, new states. So therefore, yeah. you, you will return the uh, the, uh, the equation to the form where you have U of K instead of U of K minus L. Yeah, yeah. It's a higher dimensional system, but uh, the, your your control input is some advance of the original input. Okay. And uh, then the delay is destroyed. In discrete time systems, and this is one of the basic differences with continuous time systems, the, the delay in the input problem, which is the, the, the most significant problem around delayed systems, um, is, uh, is solvable by a state ex extension. Uh, in in the same manner, and you don't require any uh, further than that, except that you have to me you have to be able to measure uh, the control input and the necessary advances to bring the the functional dependence of the input to the to the actual stage of the time k without any delays. So in that in that sense, the the discrete time system is is. Um, is different from the uh, continuous system because in continuous systems you cannot do that. It's infinite dimensional, but not in discrete time. So it appears there's a significant significant advantage of formulating the control problem in discrete time, because in the continuous time, any time you have a, a, a pure delay, you the problem become very difficult and you put a lot of upper limit on achievable performance. So how, how would that be, uh, I mean, uh, intuitively that would translate into discrete time also, you have uh, limitations on, on the type of performance you can achieve. So how would that be handled in this formulation? Yeah, the, the, the limitation r relates the limitation that the discrete time model has with respect to the continuous time model in general. It, in in nonlinear systems, it's very difficult to have a closed form expression for the exact discretization of the nonlinear system. So it, our discrete time system is an approximation of the continuous time system. And when you have delays, the approximation is, is, is still present. And that is probably one of the uh, problems in which you can run into if, if you if you have, uh, you're dealing with an approximation for a delay system, which in essence, in the continuous time manner, is infinite dimensional. And uh, in the discrete time setting is finite dimension. And uh, the, the way to relate them both is through the transfer function of the delay. The delay's uh, transfer function is just an exponential function. Uh, uh, with a, some finite time delay or with a time varying delay. And that exponential function can only be approximated by a finite polynomial in the variable S. The same happens here. Uh, that, that the approximation already implicit in the discretization 
will will affect your performance when you do the control via via system ex expansion because that expansion is finite dimensional and the nature of the delay is infinite dimension so at some point you're doing an approximation and in this case you would be doing two approximations the first approximation is the continuous to discrete time approximation that is that is always unless you have a, a, an exact discretized model which is very difficult to obtain in in practice for for all systems only the very few systems uh, you can obtain a, a closed form solution for the actual exact discretized nonlinear system and uh, normally you have to settle for an approximation that approximation is short of what you need to handle delays in continuous time in continuous time the delay is infinite dimension so to, to a certain extent if you have a native system which has a delay then there is no problem the the state expansion will give you an exact model for that native system but if the system comes from sampling you already have an approximation issue and what you're doing is you're trying to approximate by a discrete time system which is finite dimensional something which is infinite dimensional and continuous i absolutely agree you would expect some degrading of the performance when you when you try to manipulate your discretization your approximate discretization uh with uh, with all the comfort that you can you can achieve uh because because uh, the approximation is there and you didn't solve that problem in the first step yeah. thank you thank you very much um are there other questions because this is an important uh, uh point yes. in your uh, presentation uh, so maybe other uh, professors or uh, students uh, have questions but uh, this is significant because uh, now we're uh michelle free recently published a paper on how model free control can be uh, uh used in uh, internet of things and uh, this uh, uh fashionable modern uh trends um but i think a fundamental problem is when you control something over the network maybe over the 5g network like uh, autonomous vehicle the the data uh, packets uh, tra are transmitted uh, in discrete time so by nature the system is discrete so if we add this to the toolbox of uh, how we go about handling those uh, dynamic systems and control problems uh, this could uh, generate a lot of interest my my my, my final question here because <laughs> this is uh, so intriguing uh, to what degree you are uh, subject to um, precise modeling because uh, the uh, the definition of a slide output that relationship has to be precise um, yeah. right but but the system dynamic doesn't have to be right yeah that, that that's absolutely true that's a very uh, general and ubiquitous problem in, in the application of control system theory to actual uh real systems we assume that the that the model is is known at least for a, for a large class of systems like you know mechanical systems or electromechanical systems even some chemical systems you, you do have a, a a very precise model coming from very well known laws like you know newton's law or euler lagrange equations and, and some some of the laws that dominate that so you do have a precise uh, view of the of all the nonlinearities which are relevant in the system but of course you know that some parameters uh, are not precisely known no matter how much effort you you invest in in knowing the precise value of an inertia or an elasticity there are some some errors in the in the measurements there are some nonlinearities in in a linear spring uh, there are some nonlinearities which which can be excited that at some point beyond beyond the operating region and all these all these defects of of your description of the system of course they will appear when you want to uh, close the loop with a with a law that 
that was based on an ideal model. That, that's a perfectly general model. The great advantage that active disturbance rejection has is that you're, you're basically forcing your system to the model that you are adopting. And if the model is clean enough, because you are, you are estimating whatever nonlinearities are being excited in the actual operation of the system, or some other external influences are being uh, estimated in a rather close manner and, and they are either annihilated via feedback or they are attenuated via, via proper compensation, then, then you're bringing the, the, the reality of the system closer to your, to your uh, model. And therefore the behavior is, is very, very much uh, described by the model that you adopted. But this is a unique feature of, of robust control, perhaps in general. You deal with the uncertainties that you know are there, and most of the uncertainties come in the modeling stage, and some other uncertainties come from the environment in which the system is, is operating, and you don't know them precisely, and, and you cannot afford to measure those in a manner that requires a big investment. Therefore, you are uh, in the science of control. You have some defect of your of your um, of your model with respect to the reality it portrays. The assumption is that your model portrays relevant re re realities, and those relevant re realities uh, is what you can actually measure, and you can give a little bit of freedom to wander around that particular ideal behavior. And that is usually how, how life goes on. I mean, you, unless you have a very precise problem of controlling uh, an arm robot to nano, nanometers, uh, of course you cannot afford, uh, you know, oscillations of millimeters, but uh, in, in a normal process, you, it would be still okay if, if you don't reach that degree of precision. And that depends very much on the model and the, and the control scheme that brings you closer to the reality reflected by the model, which is supposed to be on the, the most important part of the reality, the relevant part of the reality. But you're absolutely right. All these techniques rely on, a, on the knowledge of of your, uh, of your model in a quite precise manner. At least the structure has to be very well known so that you can assess equivalence with something which is perfectly linear. That is true. Uh, how much it deviates from this, uh, from this ideal behavior? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a choice that your control has to solve, at least in a reasonable fashion. That, that's probably... Uh, the best that people can do in all circumstances. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I didn't, couldn't help, but, but uh, I, I, I want to ask you this. Uh, Khalil in 2008 published a paper called Performance Recovery. The, the basic idea is in, in continuous time, he reduced the system to something like this, to a, to a, a canonical form, and he uh, designed the uh, Whatever performance, uh, 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 whatever control law to satisfy performance, uh, his main, his main contribution is to prove that uh, uh, the real system will converge to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, canonical uh, system uh, with the Huygens observer. So that has been uh, uh, a view that's kind of standard uh, mathematical analysis of uh, this kind of thinking with extended observers. Isidori has adopted the same uh, uh, framework. Uh, Isidori published a couple of papers uh, uh, in 2015 and 2020 this year, expanding Khalil's work. So I'm wondering if uh, uh, in the three time case, uh, anything uh, parallel or equivalent to that kind of work has been uh, obtained. In, uh, in other words, uh, can you uh, mathematically analyze or uh, even prove that you, you, you design VK to control the system 
uh, the way you want. Then there's uh, uh, um, um, some some uncertainties in the in the system, and you uh, you uh, your controller will uh, uh, at least uh, when the gain or observer gain goes to infinity, the two system will converge. There's a, a, a asymptotic behavior that can be shown. So I know this is uh, still uh, a bit early, but uh, is there a uh, way forward? Is there a path forward from here to establish some kind of uh, some kind of uh, mathematical rigor to show that you can actually recover the uh, the, uh, uh, the the design performance when the uncertainty appears? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I am aware of, of uh, some extension of uh, of high gain observers to this and high gain control uh, to this discrete time case. Uh, probably names to to look for aside from the one you mentioned uh, is also uh, the people and working with Kokotovic many years ago. They they explored the discrete time case and. They even went ahead and explored what, what it means singular perturbation in this environment, which is not 100% clear how to do this singular perturbation. But they, they went ahead and they, they formalized the problem and they obtained very, very nice results. Um, in, in the case of, of high gain observers, what, what we will run through with this flatness and fundamental ADRC problem is that you need you need some property built in in your observer and that property is is a is, is what I call the dual internal model property uh, you have to show that the estimation error has a, a cancellation property with respect to the disturbance that the model somehow of the disturbance, even though it, it might be an elementary model only involving one or two delays, that model helps you cancel the influence of, of the disturbance in the estimation errors of the observer. So that's a natural attenuation property that can be imposed without invoking high gains. You see in discrete time, in the discrete time, high gain is, is not a natural concept. This is not a concept that comes out of, of a time scaling or comes out of, of letting something be infinitely large uh, and then saturate to some value like a switch or something like that. In discrete time, the, the equivalent uh, switch for sliding mode control of these was worked out by, by Professor Utkin uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an old paper now that was published in, in one of the CDC conferences, and I can provide the reference for that. And uh, it turns out that the problem is a problem of inversion at the, at the end, and, and you need some finiteness assumption because you cannot invert the switch. You can invert the saturation function, but you cannot invert the switch. And so any, any inversion that is required by, by, the, by the theory, uh, will give you an approximation. And so the performance will not be as good as in continuous time. But uh, of course, even in continuous time, the presence of high gains is assuming that you have no dynamics which is excitable by, by, the, uh, by the infinite gain uh, control input. And that's a big assumption, not to have the hidden dynamics that usually is excited by the high gain controller or that will be present in the estimation errors of some high gain observer. Um, th this issue is very delicate in, in continuous time. I mean, under the assumption that you don't have these hidden dynamics, of course you can go ahead and, and propose a, an infinite gain controller with saturation, like a switch. But, um, but there you have to be careful and uh, the, the convergence, uh, you know, was was uh, was uh, demonstrated in, in the original work by Utkin when he was doing uh, the validation process. He used to call it 
taking limits of saturation functions converging to, towards a switch, an infinite gain switch. And in that process, you can actually show everything uh, works very well, but you have to be aware of hidden dynamics. And those are usually unmodeled. And those unmodeled dynamics will be excited when you use high gain control or high, or, or you use high gain observers in the estimation errors will appear. There, therefore, that is that is very very uh, interesting uh, area in which uh, you don't have the full advantages of continuous time in the discrete time case. But it is true; it's a limitation, and there are certain assumptions which I believe most of them are valid in practice. You can still go ahead and do the sliding mode control or do the high gain control or do the high gain observation. But re remember that, that that usually means difficulties with the unmodeled hidden dynamics, parasitics dynamics, which are excited only by the high frequency or the, are excited at the high frequency end of the spectrum with high gain controls. A high gain control usually obtain, uh, you know, injects all the frequencies into the system uh, in an ideal manner. And therefore, whatever dynamics are there in the spectrum that can be excited by these high frequencies will affect your performance at the end. You're absolutely right. This is something that, that uh, requires um, further, um, further explanation and further insight because it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a touchy issue, it's a delicate issue. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that takes you uh, so much of your time, sorry. Oh, no, no, it, it's, it, it, it is interesting because it, it gives the opportunity to, at least I, I portray my viewpoint, but you, yours, yours is, is very, very important because you have a lot of experience with this. <laughs> and you're one of the fathers of the creature. <laughs> Good. So let, let me give you an example that comes from the sampling process of two oscillators. This is a problem which was uh, uh, treated by, by Pierre Rouchon some years ago. And uh, it, it, it triggered a, a lot of interest in, in oscillatory systems, and from here it's very easy to jump to to, um, to Hamiltonian systems and even to to quantum dynamics. So, if you have a coupled uh, two coupled oscillators, suppose you have two coupled oscillators, but they're controlled by the same control input. And, and they are characterized by different natural frequencies. So this, are, this is a set of two ideal oscillators. Think of an LC circuit and another LC circuit and the same control input is in the middle trying to control the two oscillators on the side. And, um, and uh, this very much looks like something that you cannot control easily. And uh, the necessary and sufficient condition to be able to control the system will be that the natural frequencies uh, are going to be different. So if you sample that system, you obtain a fourth, uh, fourth order discrete time system where this delta uh, is representing the sampling interval. And, uh, and the control inputs appear here, exciting each one of them uh, in the same manner, the, the, the discretized oscillatory system. And uh, if you take, if you take uh, a fortunate output, from here it's not, it's not easy to see what the flat output is, but, but you sort of suspect because of the symmetry of the two relations that the difference of variables will have to be involved because that difference of variables uh, takes away the, the control and you need a, a higher relative degree, like a fourth order, you know, fourth relative degree for the flat output to exist. And um, so we, we tried the difference of the two positions of the oscillators, the, the position of oscillator one and the position of oscillator two, and you establish the difference. This is not a natural output of the system, but you can actually 
see that this is a, an endogenous uh, variable because it's constituted by the difference of two, two state variables already present in the subsystems. So if you take uh, that fortunate guess and you start computing the advances, the first advance is this, uh, is this difference of, let's say, velocities in some way. And uh, the second advance already uh, contains the presence of, uh, of the uh, oscillatory frequencies. And, but no control appears in, this, in these three advances. You take those three advances and, and you don't get the control. But only the fourth advance of this output will exhibit uh, an influence of the input in an explicit manner. So as you can see, the, the map is, 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 is simple because it's linear, but it looks messy because it contains a lot of expressions. So it's easy to, to, to see that the next advance uh, uh, already uh, has uh, an expression which depends on the control input. And precisely the, the so-called controllability term, which is what is the gain of the control, uh, would be zero if omega one would be equals to omega two. If omega one is equal to omega two, the difference y one minus y two never depends on you. And since it never depends on you, it will pretty much do whatever it wants because it satisfies a fourth order difference equation that is not affected by the control input. And therefore the system is un un uncontrollable. It only depends on the initial uh, values of the state associated with this fourth order system. So uh, the flat output is relative degree four. And from here you see that necessarily the two frequencies have to be different in order for the system to be controllable and hence flat. So when you, when you uh, examine uh, the, the flatness property, out comes the natural condition that these two, these two um, oscillators will be controllable if their frequencies are different. If the frequencies are the same, then you will not be able to control it. Because in that case, when, when the control doesn't finally influence any of your states, you're oscillating along a torus. And the oscillation along a torus can give you either a periodic uh, response or something which densely fills the torus, representing, representing the Cartesian product of the two states of the system, x, x dot and y, y dot. Therefore, the, the, the lack of flatness is, is represented by, the, by this resonance condition. Uh, they have to be different, these frequencies, and therefore the, the line on the, on the torus would be controllable. But otherwise, it's not controllable, and either you have a periodic motion or you have uh, a densely, uh, a dense trajectory on the torus that, that visits absolutely every point of the torus and it will be uncontrollable. So if, it's, if the system satisfies that basic property, then the system is equivalent to a fourth order system. And it would, in principle, be very simple to control it via this exact model. Notice that the system itself is linear, but um, but the discretization, and the discretization, of course, is linear. And therefore, flatness is equivalent to controllability. And this system is trivially controllable. So this, this exercise just tells you that, um, that flatness uh, has uh, an important uh, examination of all the, of all the variables uh, in, in, included in the system. And this relationship with the advances of that particular output is inverted. And the, the inverse, of course, is kind of messy, but you see there is a one-to-one -one relation between the states and the control input. The controllability is, in this case, equivalent to flatness. So that's one simple example that shows you that some structural properties can be easily adverted by using the flatness properties. A very natural property that tells you what, what people have known for a long time. And um, 
Of course, the relative degree condition can always be uh, expressed in terms of these directional derivatives as we did in the continuous time case. But here is a little bit different because you don't have uh, Lee, uh, Lee derivatives. I should say that under some assumptions, the Lee brackets become part of the description of the controllability of discrete time systems. But that, that invertibility requires you to be able to go forwards and backwards and create uh, you know, very small differences, differential differences with the, with the uh, round trip. And uh, when that invertibility assumption happens, then there are two maps that give you a loop around a very small circuit trying to come back to the original uh, value of the, of the state. And in there, the Lie bracket will be involved. In, in the approach we're taking, we don't need the Lie brackets because we're not, we're, we're not using this concept of, of being able to go backwards in time at leisure. Uh, we are all, we're restricting our flatness uh, definition uh, only in a forward manner and the uh, flat output and its forward advances need uh, to parameterize the state and the inputs, but not, but not uh, going backwards in time as many authors have, have, uh, have advocated. And in that, in that respect, the, the, the same problem that you have in a, in a Lie group, uh, in a sample Lie group uh, to involve or to recover the, the Lie derivatives and the Lie brackets uh, is by means of, of some invertibility in a differential manner around the evolution of the system. We're not using that here. And that, that should prevent you from, from comparing this, this work with some other which is much more complicated, much more difficult to, to understand because it, it uses deep uh, results from differential geometry and algebraic geometry. Here we don't require that machinery and we, we establish the fundamental properties in a simpler manner. So here uh, the, the directional derivatives uh, pushing the definition of directional derivative a little bit, uh, because in reality is, is all these maps are, are, are not, uh, I mean, they, tam, they come from a tangent bundle. They, they, they are not as precise as in the continuous time case. Um, so in, in this case, we can, we can uh, express the, the relative degree assumption by means of these uh, advances of the output in terms of directional derivatives that involve the state map and the input map. And uh, they're very natural. All, all these have to be zero for the system to be relative degree n, and only this one, this one map, uh, portraying the directional derivative of h in the direction of the n minus one's power of the state map times the control input map gives you something which is different from zero. This is precisely that. And this will give us a way to formally compute the flat output through its grading. When you translate this n minus one properties and this final nth property into gradients multiplied by this quote unquote vector fields here, you obtain uh, the product of this row matrix times the column matrix of, of this uh, arrangement. And, uh, and all of, of, of the products will be zero as, as this condition uh, reflects, except for the last one, which is going to be different from zero and can be a function of the state. This, this incidentally will be in general, the quotient of two analytic functions, this will be a metamorphic function. So the gradient of the, of the um, flat output is orthogonal to all these, all these uh, vectors, except the last one in which it's alpha of X and it's non-Z. So that condition allows you to compute 
the gradient of the flat output as the last row of the inverse of this matrix, which has a striking resemblance to the controllability matrix and uh, particularizes to the controllability matrix in the linear case. So the, the way to compute the gradient of the flat output is to obtain the last row of the inverse of the controllability matrix and anything which is proportional under a meromorphic function to that, to that, uh, to that row uh, will qualify as the gradient of a possible flat output. So the degree of freedom is, is, is in this function alpha of x. This function alpha of x is, is irrelevant as far as the structural property goes. But uh, you can choose it in order to make this gradient acceptably simple in order to be able to integrate and find h. This, uh, this gradient is a, gives you a very elementary integration problem in which you have to find the primitive in space of h so that its gradient equals something which is known. And that which is known is this expression. So the, in, in essence, the row gradient of the flat output, when you don't know the flat output and you want to compute it, can be obtained modulo a scalar non-zero proportionality factor function as the last row of the inverse of the controllability matrix. So you recover the property from linear systems. And if you particularize everything for the linear case, in which you have a linear map as the next state and you have a linear function of the state as the output map. All these matrices are just uh, very well known like A and B. Uh, this gradient is A and this partial of E respect to U is the vector B. And, uh, and the directional derivatives uh, coincide with the Markov parameters of the discrete linear system. This is the first Markov parameters. This is the second Markov parameters. This is the n minus one Markov parameter. And the last Markov parameter will be different from zero, indicating that the output is relative degree n. This linear function of the state has a gradient, which is just C transpose. So in order to compute that, that gradient, you, you obtain the controllability matrix, you take the last you invert it, you take the last row of the controllability matrix and you let it to be proportional to that row. And that will give you C in this particular case. So the, the, the state map in the, in the particular linear case coincides with the, uh, the I mean, the, the, the map that gives you the state coordinate transformation to obtain the flat output will give you the observability matrix in the linear case. That means the flat output is observable and that means that the flat output is able to parameterize every state in the system and including the control input. But uh, what we want to exploit is re the relation between this map, the gradient of this map is constituted by all these directional derivatives. And when you multiply this, uh, this column matrix by the row matrix representing the so-called controllability matrix. When you multiply those two, you obtain clearly a square matrix, which is, uh, which is non-singular because the, 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 of, the, the anti-diagonal of that matrix is characterized by non-zero elements. Alpha of X recall is different from zero. So when you do the, the product of the observability, the gradients of the observability map times the controllability map, you obtain an invertible uh, n by n or a full rank n matrix. And that full rank n matrix combined with the full rank nature of the observability map tells you that this matrix has to be full rank also. So the invertibility of this matrix is not in question because we were using the inverse of that matrix without re actually knowing if this matrix was invertible or not. Well, the justification that you can do that comes from the invertibility of the 
uh, observability map, which is precisely the map that contains the state coordinate transformation, which is invertible and non-singular, and the gradients are linearly independent. When you multiply that matrix times the controllability matrix because of the definition of relative degree, the product of this row vector times all these column vectors will be zero, except the last one, which will be alpha of x. And when you adjoin to this uh, row gradient, the gradients of the state map in, in uh, increasing powers of that matrix, you will obtain that non-zero factor much earlier. And it doesn't matter what you have in the rest of the products, the fact that this anti-diagonal is non-singular, has never a, a zero factor, will give you the invertibility of the whole matrix. So this matrix is invertible clearly, and this being invertible, the only way the product of two matrices is invertible, with one, with one of them being invertible, is that the other one cannot be singular. Therefore, this matrix is invertible. And the system is both controllable in this sense and observable. So this is a fundamental property of, of the flat output. It invokes the two most important properties of dynamical systems, uh, controllability and observability. Observability will give you parametrization, will give you the possibilities of estimation of the states. Controllability will give you the possibilities of joining trajectories from the past to the future. This, this, uh, this uh, concept of controllability comes as a full rank condition of somebody that tells you, yes, indeed, you can, by means of, of control actions, join smoothly trajectories from the past to trajectories in the future. You can interpolate and therefore you can track trajectories, you can do rest to rest equilibrium, you can visit any state you want in the state space and reach that state in a, in a smooth manner. So uh, this is one of the important properties of, of flatness. It sort of summarizes everything we have said. Let me give you a couple of examples where um, uh, the issue of, of exact linearization is clearly resolved uh, and one in which it is not. Um, for instance, a, a simple pendulum uh, couldn't be a, a simpler system than that. A simple uh, control pendulum uh, in a gravitational field with, with some discrete sampling represented by the sampling interval t. The, the, the map is, of course, nonlinear because of this gravitational term here, in which the nonlinearity of the angular position comes into play. So the system is nonlinear. And the output is usually the angular position of the of the pendulum. So x1 is the angular position, x2 uh, in subtraction from x2k divided by t is the angular velocity. And, um, and the acceleration will be this difference divided by t and the angular velocity is this difference divided by t. But the system in a discretized fashion is this. This system is, uh, has a very mild nonlinearity and the nonlinearity is somehow matched to the presence of the input. That means that from the input you will be able to eliminate nonlinearity. And this is at the, at, the, at the heart of active disturbance rejection control. You, you have a matching condition in the input output uh, representation, and therefore the control is in front of your unknown nonlinearities. And therefore that allows you uh, to cancel them, provided that you can observe them. And um, so we identify the maps immediately. Uh, the, the relevant maps are phi, the partial derivative of the state map with respect to U, the Jacobian of the state map, and the gradient representing the output map. And uh, of course, the, the observability, uh, the state coordinate transformation represented by the observability map has independent gradients. That's, that's easy to see from from this relation. And uh, so the output x1 is relative degree 2, as could have been guessed from here. Uh, you know, if I know x1, I know x2. And if I know x2, 
and x1, I know u. So the x1 is relative degree two. And uh, it can be easily seen here that the elements of the controllability matrix are, are just phi u and phi x times phi u. And uh, that will give you the relative degree two condition on the, on the angular position. Of course, this is the gradient of h times uh, phi of u. And this is the gradient of h times phi x phi of u that gives you something which is different from zero. So the system is clearly relative degree two. And the controllability matrix would be immediately obtained as the composition, as these two maps in, 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 in column vectors. And the inverse is just that. So the, the, the flat output is obtained from the inverse of the controllability matrix uh, and uh, in, in a proportionality factor that will give you uh, this, this row vector as the gradient of the flat out. That means that uh, you can take x1, the first component, as the actual gradient of the flat output because alpha is anything you, you want, so alpha can be t squared, and therefore, uh, choosing that, you have x1 as the flat out. Of course, everything is, is nice in this example, and the forward shifts allow you to define a state coordinate transformation that exactly linearizes the system, provided you can solve from the last equation for the control input. And then there is no problem, because this map for the control input is inverted. And that comes from the relative degree condition, the, the partial derivative of, of the advance of the output with respect to u is different from zero, and in fact, is equal to t squared. So there is no structural problem here, and you can you can obtain the canonical form very easily. I mean, this is a state coordinate transformation; it's trivial, and, and it's an invertible state coordinate transformation, and the canonical form gives you a an, nonlinear an term, which can be solved for you when you replace all this expression by, a, by an auxiliary control input B. Therefore, the system is linear and linearizable, and, and uh, the forward shift uh, viewpoint allows you to assess flatness, and therefore you can easily control the system. Uh, and of course, the parameterization of the control input goes uh, through the second order system which uh, is also parameterizable in terms of y and its advances. So the system, there's no doubt, is flat, and you can solve locally for that flat output in terms of the, of the, um, of the system uh, structure. And that, that coincides with the flatness of the, of the control pendulum. Uh, there is a, so there would be a one-to-one -one relation here between the, the equations of the, control pendulum and the equations of the discretized pendulum, no problem. But uh, that is not always the case. That is uh, the warning that, that brings this elementary example into focus. Uh, let me give you, before giving you this example, let me give you another example, which is the, the boost converter. The boost converter is nonlinear. It has, it has these nonlinearities here has an equilibrium point in the average, we can treat the average system by a process which is called state averaging, which is in this case, gives you this exact same model as in the switch case, but U will be replaced by, let's say a duty ratio, or U would be a smooth function varying between zero and one. So the average model is no different from the actual model, except that the interpretation of the control is in average term. In the average model of this nonlinear system, the equilibrium is very easy to, to be assessed. If the, uh, if the equilibrium for X2 is the, which is the voltage, is the value capital V, then in equilibrium, these two, uh, these two uh, states coincide. Uh, division by t doesn't affect you, so in equilibrium, u is the inverse of this equilibrium voltage. And uh, the equilibrium voltage would be v. And from this expression, when you in, impose the conditions of equilibrium, 
the X1 can be computed in terms of the equilibrium X2 and the equilibrium of U, which were already computed. So the equilibrium is perfectly determinable from the system uh, dynamics. And uh, what I want to, to uh, emphasize here is this system is not feedback linearizing. Nevertheless, the continuous time version of the boost converter being nonlinear uh, is feedback linearizing. The, the average model of the continuous version of the boost converter is feedback linearizing. And the flat output is, is the, the total store energy. The flat output would be x1 squared divided by two plus x2 squared divided by two. That is the flat output of the continuous time system. In discrete time, this model does not accept that as a flat output. Because even though in the two advances you will reach the, the control input, the map generated by the two advances of that output is not invertible. It's not invertible in the state space. You need to remember something from the past in order to be able to invert. So you need two extra state variables to make that transformation invertible. But now you will have a fourth order system which is only linearizable up to second order. And the other two states uh, are required in order to find that inverse transformation. So the, the observability map is not invertible in the state space that you, that you have advocated here by naming currents and voltages as your original state value. That, that is not feedback linearizable. It is linearizable partially by dynamical feedback. And uh, this is another big difference of, of discrete time systems with the continuous time counterpart. Uh, in the continuous time part, counterpart, continuous systems, which are single input, are static feedback linearizable without, if they are feedback linearizable by a static state feedback and input coordinate transformation, uh, it has been shown that that, that is the case of, of the continuous single input, single output nonlinear system. When, when uh, you cannot, in the continuous time case, when you cannot linearize your system by a static state feedback, you cannot linearize it by dynamical state feedback either. In continuous time systems, uh, static feedback linearization is all you have. If, you, if that is, doesn't work for you in linearizing the system desire, then dynamical feedback linearization doesn't buy you anything that you cannot achieve with discrete with with feedback linearization in a static manner however in discrete time systems systems which are uh, not feedback linearizable by a static state feedback like this case can be partially linearized in the original state variables by dynamical state feedback. But it's only a partial linearization that recovers the dimension of the original system as you want it. But the flat output, in order to invert the transformation, you require more states that are not present in the representation. So this is a fundamental difference with continuous time systems. Dynamical feedback linearization has something to say in the single input, single output case. That is something that in the continuous time case does not exist. Feedback linearization in a dynamical manner has nothing to contribute to the linearization of single input, single output systems in the continuous time, but they are relevant in the discrete time. But remember, that linearization is only partial. And you got away with the linearization of the two original state variables. But your state space has been incremented 
by two dimensions in order for you to have an invertible state coordinate transformation. And, uh, and why are, is that invertible state coordinate transformation important or relevant? Because you want to implement your control inputs in terms of feasible states that you can measure. And in this case, you have to remember the past value of two states. And of course, a computer can do that, but that, that already occupies two extra slots of memory that in the continuous time case, you didn't have the need to do. So this is something which is not equivalent by any means to the continuous time case. So uh, an alternative that I, that I want to, to pose is you have to resort to approximate linearization. This, this is nonlinear. This is discrete and nonlinear. And of course, it's an approximate model of a discrete time model. A second approximation would be to linearize the system around this average equilibrium point. And in order to do that, you introduce incremental variables. And these incremental variables are just the discrepancy of the actual variable from the equilibrium values. So by introducing that, those incremental variables, you have a linearized model of the nonlinear discrete time system. Now, this linearized model happens to be controllable. And the controllability matrix is full rank, and therefore, you can invert it and obtain the flat out. And you can see now that the last row of the inverse of the controllability matrix times some constant factor that eliminates some of the, of the deltas and the Qs here um, will give you, will give you uh, the flat output. And this flat output uh, has, has nothing to do at first sight with the total store energy of the system. Of course, it does have some some relationships with the power because you're multiplying voltage times current and this uh, this voltage is even multiplied by a number one which is the normalized voltage source input so this is the units of this would be voltage square you know energy and this is current times voltage divided by the resistor that gives you voltage square so it's it's an energy but it's a very hidden energy and it doesn't have the quadratic nature of the energy and therefore you don't but this is the flat output and uh, the observability matrix associated with that flat output is full run so this is this is a point that, uh, that that i wanted to stress as a fundamental difference between inputs and outputs and uh, discrete time uh, nonlinear systems and continuous time counterparts. Here is another uh, little example involving uh, uh, a DC, uh, DC to DC power converter feeding a DC motor. This power converter is, is linear, is the back converter and is feeding a DC motor and you have a fourth order system and uh, the angular position of the motor gives you an extra state variable, which makes the whole system a fifth order model. And here by inspection, you could actually tell with some patients what is the flat output. The flat output happens to be the angular position of the motor. Uh, at first sight, this variable, uh, you, you see, you might run into a lot of complexity before you reach the control input, but by inspection, it's very easy to assess flatness here. If you knew theta completely, then you can compute W, the angular velocity. It's just the, the time derivative of that or the difference divided by the sampling interval. So omega is computable from knowledge of theta. And if omega is known, and, uh, and uh, then you can compute the current. This is a disturbance torque. The disturbances don't enter into the description of the structural properties. This is a rule of a golden rule. If, if you want to assess a structural property, you have to forget about the disturbances, at least to establish, to be able to establish 
the clean structural property. Of course, when you're going to do design, you have to take into account that disturbance. And now you recompute the, the structural property in terms of those disturbances. And that will give you an assessment of the total influence of the disturbances in the, in the actual um, the structural property that you want to exploit. But uh, in, the, in the first run, disturbances are, are, have to be eliminated from the picture because they are exogenous variables and flatness is an endogenous property and uh, this endogenous property has to be free of any foreign influence although when you're going to do the design and you're going to try to control your system and and prescribe a control law of course the disturbance has to be taken into account and propagated through the flatness property in this case to see what relationship is there to expect and uh, if you can get rid of the influence of that disturbance or not and uh, and therefore you you neglect that disturbance uh, omega is computable from theta knowing omega can al allows you to compute the armature current knowing the armature current which is here and here and here uh, allows you to compute the voltage because you already know the, the angular velocity, your variable omega. So you compute the voltage of the, of the uh, input to the motor, which is the output voltage of the converter. This VK is the output voltage of the converter. So, so far, knowing the angular position of the machine, you are able to compute the electrical input to the armature current by going through the armature current and going through the angular velocity and now that you know the angular the, the input voltage in terms of the angular position of the axis of the motor you know this and therefore from here and you know vk because you compute it from here and you know the armature current you can compute the inductor current of the converter so now the inductor current of the converter is a complex function of the angular position and knowing the i sub k you go to the next equation and you see that these are already known uh, known variables and you can compute the control so everybody everybody in this system is a function of the angular position so the angular position is the flat output and you have a, a fifth order system uh, which modulo some horrendous gain can establish a fifth order relation between theta and u and that gain is is in this case is known to be a constant but uh, as you can see flatness can be assessed uh, by inspection in many many cases of course this is an elementary case and um, and you know that uh, the important variable to be controlled here let's say is the position of the of the of the axis of the motor therefore it is nice to know that that position is is directly related to the control input through a fifth order pure delay system or pure advanced system and the rest is just uh, all the endogenous uh, garbage for forgive me for saying that that will give you all the all the interrelations between the states going in their way towards the control input from this particular special output so this 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 uh, example shows that that you can actually do that by inspection uh in a system and of course if you want to compute precisely the influence of the disturbance now you put everything in terms of the flat output and the disturbance and that will give you a, a perturbed difference parameterization and those perturbed difference parameterizations are very nice to know when you want to solve uh, trajectory tracking problems because the influence of that of that disturbance whether they are constant or not can be assessed in the parameterization 
And uh, in some instances, it, it gives rise to strategies that you can use in order to make your system insensitive with respect to uh, the presence of, of those uh, disturbances, which might be constant or might be time varying. So the, the, the flatness provides you with a tool and that tool allows you to give uh, uh, an answer to the control problem in a structural fashion. And then you take care of all the details. If you don't know some of the parameters, then you have to implement some, some um, you know, uh, identification pr process in order to be able to compute them uh, sufficiently fast in order to complement your control law. But the structural basic problem is fundamentally solved from the idea of examining the relation of the flat output, if you can find it, with the input. And, uh, and, uh, and another example, very simple example of a chemotherapy problem in which you have uh, two types of cells evolving and you want to control the, the growth of one of the populations of the cells through a control input represented by the chemotherapy uh, in a very elementary manner, you can actually show that that nonlinear system um, has a controllability matrix, which is even the, even, uh, the elements of the controllability matrix are dependent on the input. This is a truly nonlinear system but the gradient of the inverse of the controllability matrix are proportional to this vector. So from here, clearly N2 is the flat output. And the way to assess it by inspection is, if I know N2, then I, I know N1. And knowing N1, I know all these terms, I can know U. And, and that is the, the inspection test that, that readily gives you uh, controllability and then you go to the details of establishing the the parameterization the difference parameterization in terms of the flare output and possibly the input output relation in in active disturbance rejection control this would be a very a very substantial identity that, that allows you to carry out the design by neglecting all these nonlinearities and uh, and uh, you know establishing what you need in order to determine this, this uh, gain. But in essence, the system is a second order system related to the, to the input by means of a, of a nonlinear gain and a, a nonlinear endogenous uh, disturbance. If, if, if you want to neglect all these terms, it can be done by means of active disturbance rejection control, provided that you can cancel reasonably this nonlinear gain. Therefore, um, flatness gives you that way of assessing, assessing many properties of the system and, uh, and do design, of course, carry out the design. All the influence of any disturbance that appears in the system will either appear here or more, uh, more uh, difficult, the most, the most difficult cases when the disturbance also affects the gain, because then you're forced to replace the design gain by something which reasonably uh, portrays the actual value of the gain, which might be infected by the presence of disturbance. That incidentally happens very much in the boost converter and many other converters, which are nonlinear. Um, Okay, I would like to know if there are any questions. Bing Wen. As of now. Where in that lecture, yes. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? I think I asked too many questions already. No, so. that's, that's perfectly oh, right. I appreciate them very much because they they allow me to, to go over things that probably I overlooked or things that people are wondering that are not asking. I, 
I was telling uh, people that uh, perhaps you you are the only one uh, that uh, have an in-depth knowledge of both worlds of AVRC, of course, but also uh, the um, the whole literature on nonlinear control and sliding mode. <laughs> And, and uh, so, so it's always uh, a uh, illuminating uh, to talk to you about this um, connection. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, your previous lectures on um, on, on, on geometric control, uh, the the, the Ishidori uh, and Kokovich uh, uh, kind of theory, uh, very was very illuminating and helpful. And, and this is a uh, more of a discrete extension to it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's very illuminating. And uh, I don't know uh, if I send you uh, the Isidore's paper, uh, 2015 and 2020, and he's doing ADRC now, but he called it really? server. Oh, that, that's that's very interesting because he, he has a very good technical uh, approach to things. I would be more than delighted to 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 take a look at. It. I haven't run across it, okay. but I would appreciate if you can send it to me. That would be fantastic. Yeah. And, and uh, he, he wrote a book in 2017, and in the book he basically wrote the ADRC uh, uh, control law in it, but of course he called it something different. But uh, but basically yeah. extended, uh, extended observer, and uh, he called it extended observer instead of extended state observer. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so I think uh, it's uh, uh, very good for us because now we have a, 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 a new kind of uh, theoretical support for this kind of thinking. It, it, it become a more or less a mainstream. Uh, it, it joined the mainstream. Yeah. It used to be discarded as a kind of a, a side, uh, side uh, uh, work, but now it's uh, entered into uh, Khalil and Isidore's vocabulary and, and their papers. Yes, and uh, as I believe I mentioned you some, some days ago, uh, I believe, first of all, that it's fantastic that Professor Isidori is, is doing contributions in this area. And, uh, and, and, and that sort of is very satisfactory because he, he is a very or, you know, ordered guy with a beautiful mind that, that will give you a lot of insight into the mathematics and, and the practical aspects. But also Stan Zak, Z A K, yeah, you mentioned from, from Purdue, has has a, a, a tutorial in the next in the upcoming ACC in Denver, in which he he gives a, a course on on observer based. I mean, if you if you read the abstract of of his course, you immediately see that what he's doing most surely is, is active disturbance rejection control. Mm -hmm. Right. But okay. this is a person that comes from sliding mode control area of Lyapunov stability and uh, neural networks. And uh, it just landed into ADRC, which is right. very nice to know. <laughs> so, 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 so maybe uh, you, you, you are in the best position you're in the best position to uh, comment on this. So, so does it mean that uh, uh, this nonlinear control that used to be a, a purely model based, you know, lead feedback linearization, um, um, geometric control, they, they're all uh, dependent on precise mathematical model. Now these uh, uh, highly regarded scholars recognizes that you, you don't need a highly accurate mathematical model. You uh, you can relax that uh, uh, presumption, and uh, you can inject this into uh, uh, inject new life into this. Uh, of course, the, uh, in their uh, mind, this uh, expansion is the improvement of their previous work, as opposed to wholesale uh, 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 change. Uh, but it does provide us a, a uh, an, an analytical uh, support in yeah. what uh, we are doing, and and, and Isidore is uh, very uh, graceful, and he always attributed uh, the extended extended observer to Professor Han's uh, uh, paper in Chinese 
from 1995. Wow. <laughs> so I, maybe he learned how to read uh, Chinese, or but he always uses that um, that um, well, paper as a starting point of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 and the the method, the even the terminologies are uh, very similar. That instead of uh, um, uh, um, F and B in ADRC, they they have a uh, what uh, G and F, G and F, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's almost <laughs> identical. And, and uh, the other school, <laughs> right? You know, in the old days there were two schools of control theory. In the East, they had the A B C D uh, representation of linear systems, and in California, in the West, they had the F G H uh, sort of <laughs> representation of linear systems. Right, so so maybe some student will be able to uh, uh, dig out the, the history on this. Uh, earlier in Han's career, in uh, I think it was in the late seventies, early eighties, that he proposed a uh, feedback minimization techniques for nonlinear uh, control, and uh, a couple of students from uh, uh, Tsinghua University, a couple of PhD students, applied that to power systems uh, to to great effect. And uh, and they won the Guangzhou Zhi Award, the, the most pre prestigious uh, award in control uh, um, community, uh, and this was in the early '90s. Uh, it's uh, it provided from what they told me, uh, it's a much simpler approach to get to the same uh, solution as the geometric control would provide. So, uh, so Han, Han was not far from a geometric control. He just uh, didn't uh, think it's necessary to go uh, that go into that much trouble to to, formal, to formalize it. But he proposed he, so, so he first proposed the uh, uh, feedback linearization technique, which is model based, as I uh, understand. And then he, uh, 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 of course, developed ADRC to uh, relax that uh, that condition. So now his story uh, com comes into uh, the, the picture. So uh, I, I, I couldn't think of a better person uh, than you to uh, put this whole story together. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this whole thing runs in circles. So now, now, now they uh, converge, now they overlap. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. I, I believe that that's the case. It's fantastic to know all these contributions that were made by, by, by um, by Professor Han so long ago, and that uh, probably the, the the underlying language barrier prevented it uh, from being widely acknowledged in, in in our side of the world. But now that we know and that we have that that uh, verification, there shouldn't be any excuse for for not for not. Uh, quoting him and following his work or expanding his work or just recognizing his work is one of the basic of yeah it's a it's a pity, it's a it's a pity he didn't publish uh, uh, papers earlier in his career or in, in, even in the most of his career he didn't publish in English but his idea is so expensive it covers yeah. so many directions and uh, his, uh, uh, his work on differential uh, uh, on differentiator. I mean, there was one uh, one scholar in China spent his entire career on on improving uh, Han's differentiator, and uh, and he was able to apply it to uh, to uh, uh, magnetic magnetic levitation in uh, uh, trains. Yeah. And so 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 that's uh, that's that's just a small part of his work. And uh, it's, it's just uh, mind-boggling uh, to see the reach of his uh, ideas, and not 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 even uh, the biggest name in nonlinear control come back to his idea. His yeah. idea. It's, 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 it's not it's not just a, a ESO. It's not just a, a algorithm. It's a it's a force of idea behind it. it it's, yeah. Yeah. So so uh, I, so so we 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 feel uh, fortunate that the. The, the, to have you, uh, you, know, you, you spent uh, decades in uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in sliding mode control, in uh, geometric control, and uh, you published so many papers and so many books. 
And uh, so, so that's why I, I, I peppered you with all these questions because you're the only one. Oh, no, that, I, I appreciate those, as I mentioned. I, I appreciate them really very much because, because it gives me an opportunity to, to also listen to your, your side. And this, this historical perspective is very important because uh, in, in, in our, in our uh, profession, we're so busy with things that are going on and uh, most of the time don't, don't take the time to go back and, and see the basis and the fundaments of, of things that were worked out long ago and uh, with original ideas that, that still prevail and that can be expanded to some other domains in a manner that, uh, that will give benefits to our profession. Right. This is something that, that of, of course, it, it has to be, it has to be uh, emphasized uh, as time goes on because people tend to forget, you know, you, you, you quote the reference of the reference not very often and uh, you, you, you stay at the reference and then, and then the original idea is, is, never, is never visited. And in, in that original idea, there might be elements that, that uh, will give you new avenues. And this is the case with Professor Hans' ideas. He had so many contributions that uh, his ideas seem to be very fresh, even nowadays, because he was addressing important issues, very important issues. Right. So, so uh, I understand each scholar devotes uh, uh, almost their entire uh, his or her career on something like uh, uh, geometric method, nonlinear control, or Huygen observer, Huygen, Huygen feedback control, and uh, they would tend to uh, bring all the other ideas into uh, their fold to see this is a particular. Uh, so, so one, 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 uh, one. Uh, Particular case is a uh, high gain, uh, high gain feedback principle. Uh, that I think it's uh, uh, from very early in the nonlinear control literature, and also high gain observer, particularly Khalil's work. Uh, so that lead to uh, quite a few of uh, papers or uh, scholars uh, to call ESO a high gain observer. And uh, I always had a bit of trouble uh, with that. Uh, uh, I want to uh, listen to your uh, your uh, your uh, uh, take on on, on this. Uh, you know, it, uh, so so it, it goes back to the Huygen uh, uh, Huygen feedback principle. I mean, there's a, a Isidore in his paper and book give uh, re references to. Uh, to to uh, to that concept, Huygen uh, Huygen uh, feedback design, Huygen feedback control. I think that's a, a, a predecessor to Huygen observer, and uh, um, is it a particular uh, structure of uh, uh, control design, or is this uh, a uh, only uh, reference to how to, to to the fact that that they can only prove something when the gain goes to infinity? You know, what what is your take on that? Yeah, m mathematically, it's it's very convenient because you, you can you can proceed with a limit that gives you properties um, uh, on one side. Uh, on the other side, it, you know, physically, physically, everybody who has attempted to do some controlling in the lab knows the risks involved in in using high gain control, uh, but. Of course, we can come to a compromise in which the, the whole thing is useful. And, um, and you're always playing with, with the, a trade-off. How much of a high gain can the system sustain before it starts giving you trouble with the hidden dynamics and so on? And uh, what you lose by, by not using high gain is something which is in the balance. And, and something that you're forced to assess in many, many instances. Uh, one of the things is high gain has limited robustness, as can be easily shown by an idealization of, of a switch, which is the prototypical infinite gain element in nonlinear systems. Um, 
And, and this validation process uh, of going through the limit from, from a saturation switch to, a, to an infinite gain switch uh, is very illuminating because it, it tells you what risks are you overlooking in doing that process. This, this work uh, was, was undertaken many years ago by Professor Utkin and one of the students of Peter Kokorovich at the time, which, which uh, became a, a very well-known uh, scientist, David Young, his, his Chinese of origin. David Young and Vadim Utkin undertook the problem of clarifying the relations between infinite gain uh, sliding mode control and high gain sliding mode control or high gain control in general, and looking for the parallels and looking for, for the equivalence that is intrinsic in, the, in these two avenues of research. And uh, Utkin and Young have, have very interesting contributions in the area of, of high gain control. And also Professor Ricardo Marino from La Sapienza in Italy uh, produced in the 1990s a beautiful paper uh, related to the geometric theory of high gain systems. And, um, and that, that, those pieces of work, uh, I'm sure, are related to Hans' work. Uh, it, it only takes somebody to fish out the relevant contributions of the time and just study in a parallel fashion with the contributions given by, by Professor Han at the time. And I believe that you will find a striking parallelism, although the, the, you know, the rigor with which Ricardo Marino approached this is, is beautiful because it's geometric theory. And Utkin and, and Jung approach this from a, from a very knowledgeable viewpoint of all the background that both of them had in sliding mode control and the relation with optimal processes. And um, this is something worthwhile pursuing. And I, I believe an interested student uh, should undertake that, that comparison and establish in a, in a paper the, the parallels, the differences, the areas of intersection, and so on. So, so, so what you are saying is, uh, <clears throat> uh, with high gain or infinite gain, uh, or with gain uh, goes to infinity, you you have that nice mathematical proof of convergence of uh, asymptotic behavior. But what's missing is in the middle, that the gain is not high, is not low. What's what is the characteristics of the system um, in that uh, range? I mean, that's where uh, most engineering um, systems operate at, not, not getting at infinity, of course not, mm -hmm. right? Of course not. Um, so, so in the geometric theory and also in the high gain uh, uh, feedback theory, was that a missing part? Well, uh, I, I believe that that's an assessment that is intuitively uh, carried out by people who want to use high gain in place of, of actual switches. And, uh, and you know from the start that high gain exhibits some robustness, but not the clean type of ideal robustness you get with infinite gain. Uh, and, uh, and this assessment has to be uh, you know, in practical terms, could have been exploited uh, in a theoretical fashion to give you bounds and results and say, this is, this is what you should do for a given system. Uh, this is what you need to assess in order to see what the high gain will buy for you. And why don't you, you don't need to go to infinite gain uh, because of this involved risk that this property might, might disappear when you go to, to infinite gain, or it might become troublesome. That assessment in, in clear, nice terms, which are not only practical, but that needs some mathematical machinery to be established, 
uh, needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done. So, so uh, when you say robustness, uh, in some, certain or uh, some kind of robustness with high gain, do you mean that uh, that in the uh, Kudio's uh, high gain observer, F and G are unknown? And uh, so, so he, 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 he chose to, uh, to use high gain to suppress the uncertainty, and he can prove that mathematically, as gain goes to infinity, that in fact, the knowledge of F and G function are not necessary in the stability proof. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but it's not robust in a sense, like you mentioned, uh, hidden dynamics. Right, so so uh, so so in his work or in his uh, in the high gain literature, is there a uh, presumption that the hidden hidden dynamic um, is not uh, uh, there or is not to be included in the uh, consideration? The the only people I know that included the hidden dynamics uh, are in the works of. Kokotovich and Perkins and, and uh, many others at the time in, in the uh, coordinated science lab many, many years ago. And, um, and of course, they looked at the issue of excitation of hidden dynamics and worked out bounds, bounds for the performance on the basis of, of, uh, of neglecting those dynamics and the influence of that in the in the in the singular perturbation case, which is a limiting case, and in the in the intermediate uh, gain case, uh, they 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 mainly did linear systems. But already there, you have uh, you have um, a, a lot of of insight that needs to be further explored. And if you compare that with Professor Hans' work. That, that's fantastic because he was working in more general terms, even though he was not using sophisticated mathematical tools, but he, he was relying on, on what the mathematics told him and the experience. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> maybe one final uh, question uh, on the subject is, uh, <clears throat> uh, the so-called high gain feedback or high gain observer, it cannot be just arbitrary control structure or ob observer structure. That, that you can apply high gain now. It doesn't mean a uh, special structure of uh, a control or observer where uh, the, um, um, the property of system can be, uh, or, or, or a nice property can, of system can be obtained by pushing the gain to very high or almost to infinity. So, 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 so it's not just a, a high in terms of parameter value. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, some kind of a, uh, uh, so, so-called Huygen, uh, Huygen, Huygen design just uh, doesn't mean a certain structure of design, not just the value of the uh, uh, parameters. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that that has to be part of it because, it, it, you know, the structure is important. Unless you're in the very special case of flatness where the structure collapses to a very simple structure. Right. Uh, but the, the real issue probably is with systems which are non-flat. Those are the hard to control. And if you have this issue there, uh, then it is worthwhile to know what the limitations you're facing with whatever linearization you can carry out into the system, which is only partial. And it's not complete. And, uh, and the structure is definitely would play a role there because whatever you have in the, in the area of influences or consequences of your high gain design into the zero dynamics are, are, are crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason I'm saying is that the, when I look at the high gain uh, observer uh, of uh, Professor Carrillo, uh, it's a particular structure of observer uh, where uh, the, all the parameters are collapsed into one single value, epsilon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for that, so, so, so he only need to uh, make if epsilon go to zero to show the property of the uh, uh, observer. But that behind the epsilon is a, is, is a unique 
observer design. It's a stru it's a unique structure that makes it happen. So so what I take is that the so so called uh, 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 Huygen observer design or extended Huygen, Huygen observer is a particular structure of the uh, of the um, uh, 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 observer, not necessarily uh, uh, the, um, um, the 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 uh, the value or the parameter itself. This is important because uh, it, it seems to it seems uh, uh, to be uh, uh, overlapping between ESO and extended Huygen observer. It seems to have the same structure except in the on the ESO side. We parameterize it with omega O as a bandwidth, which is a physical variable. It's a, it's a but very intuitive in uh, engineering sense. And uh, uh, and the whole point is to keep omega low, omega O low, so so you don't uh, trigger an, uh, a hidden, hidden dynamic. You, you don't uh, uh, amplify noise unnecessarily. So we we would never call ESO high gain observer <coughs> because the uh, we want to minimize. We want to minimize the uh, the gain of ESO uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, what we needed for 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 the control purposes. So uh, I'm struggling with this. I mean, uh, and also I'm struggling with uh, communicating this idea to my colleagues. So maybe you can help me uh, with a better uh, explanation or better um, uh, terminology. Yeah, I, I believe we all all are in the same in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. Vincent colleagues, this is one of the important aspects of our work. Uh, it has to be. Right. Right. There has to be something in the middle. You cannot go extreme. I mean that that problem problem we have uh, I have with a sliding mode control is you you go from low to high I mean constantly and it seems you are you are living on the edges. You're you, that that just doesn't doesn't uh, uh, coincide with my engineering uh, uh, side of this. In, in engineering, you always you always want to be moderate. You want to to take actions, not too drastic action. That, like the hidden dynamic uh, uh, you mentioned. If you if you do this too uh, too quickly, you excite all the resident mode in the system, and uh, you you are you'll be in the world of troubles. So philosophically, uh, this this drastic uh, uh, maximum or uh, minimum control action uh, and the constant switching between them, philosophically, it doesn't uh, coincide with engineering reality. That's that's just my opinion. Yeah, um, I, I would qualify your statement, which is absolutely true for a large class of of physical systems, but I would qualify that because there there are systems in which you have no choice. I mean, your control is a switch. Right. Your control is yes or not. And it, it, it takes no time in passing from on to off. It takes no time. It doesn't make any difference because the switch is designed to work that way. Very fast. The faster, the better. You, know, you have transistors nowadays that can switch billions of times in a second. And uh, in that class of systems, you have no choice. But of course, what you say is absolutely true. If you want to control a mechanical system with this type of control, you, you're bound to have problems. You're exciting flexibilities and you're exciting dynamics that you don't have into your system. And you, if you want to control a chemical process that way, you cannot do it. Simply cannot do it. These things take their time and they only accept very nice controls, considered controls. But in, 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 th in areas like power electronics, or error correction codes for billions of times per second. And, uh, and of course, in there, the, the the theory allows you to get some to some sort of average behavior in which the, the switch will never heat up. The, the, the switch is ideal. It, it will always be commuting widely uh, from one value to another and creating some average sort of dynamics which is beneficial. This is the only area that I know and that I'm familiar with that in which 
high gain, infinite gain control works uh, appreciably practically for you. But mm -hmm. aside from that area, and this is one of the reasons why I, I was so inter I have been so interested in, 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 in power electronics, because for me, is the only natural area of sliding mode control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, robot systems, mechanical systems, cars, uh, they shouldn't be controlled with, with these continuous control inputs. I mean, you, you're, you're asking for wear and tear, you're asking for, for problems that were not present in your original design objectives. You're destroying your, your, your system reliability at some point. While in electronics, it doesn't matter. I, I mean, the, the electrons move so fast that you can, you can bounce them on and off uh, forward and backwards with no, no inertia problem. Yeah. And, and this is accomplished by a switch, but, but, yeah. uh, but when you're doing this with the machine, uh, no, it's, it's, it's only in fantastic circumstances that this works. There is a, there is a, a place in, in Sheffield in, in England, you know, this was a high industrial center in the, in the industrial revolution. And they have this big, big vapor machine, which is enormous. It, it just weighs hundreds of tons. And it has a wheel, which is immense. It has like three meters in radius, and it goes through two stories. And this machine, there, there is a guy there that became famous. He's a touristic attraction because he's able to switch this machine, which is going forward at a very high speed with this enormous wheel, of six meters in diameter, going forward is a steel wheel, very, very, very large, very heavy. I don't know how many tons it weights. And it's going forward at an appreciable speed, and he does some maneuver with the with the valves and things, and he and he reverts the the motion in almost no time. But. But he, he, he does this as a touristic attraction because he's the only guy capable of doing this and demonstrated to people what he can do with this enormous machine, which is part of a museum. It's not even working in an actual factory. It's part of a museum because of this. And, um, and uh, but aside from that, which is spectacular, uh, I don't, I don't believe you can design a process based on that property that's going forever because at, at some point the machine will break. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I want to qual qualify your qualification. Uh, two, two things. One is uh, we have a, a lab a experiment in a lab controlling water level. We, uh, we use a lot. Sorry, controlling, controlling uh, water level in a tank. Water level, okay. Okay, so so uh, we we buy a, a on off valve, uh, electro mechanical valve for twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. So 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 then you you can control this. You can you you you, you don't want to switch it too fast. So you don't if it switch too fast, you wear it out too easily. But if you want to have a more precise control, more smooth control, you buy a $400 proportional valve. So in industry, people are very clear that there are cheap valves where they're just on and off, and, but you live with the consequences. But there, uh, if you want a better performance, you go to a higher, uh, higher uh, level of uh, actuators. So, so yeah, I, I agree with you that the most of the industrial applications you see smooth control, you don't want on and off. But when you come to power electronic, Professor Li Hui here is a power electronic expert. I visited his lab in Shanghai. Um, I think you are right that the, a lot of the uh, uh, devices are controlled by PWM. By nature, they're on and off. Okay? But if you look uh, at the physics more closely, uh, PWM controlling the um, I mean, uh, for example, the motor control, you, 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 the uh, voltage, but uh, it induces a current, a, a motor current, and that current, you don't want it to be choppy. 
so even though in uh, in the point electronic you do have critical end it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, one end of the uh, the device on the other end of the device when you convert voltage to current you you uh, you still want the current to be smooth otherwise you you introduce all kind of jerks into yeah, uh, yeah. Your motion and you destroy your transmission you destroy many your load yeah. so um, I think it's not a blank uh, 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 coverage that uh, anytime you use PWM, you are free to do the switching uh, to the sliding mode controls. So I just want to throw that <laughs> in there. Yes, uh, the, 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 like a power converter, maybe. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, you're absolutely right. With a power converter, perhaps you, you know, you, 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 there's not uh, there's not as much concern, but with a when you connect it to a motor, to a, a actual uh, yeah. device. Yeah, right. You, you're right again, because you see the, the, all these pumps or motors are electromechanical systems. The, the, the electrical part is one thing, and it sustains, it sustains um, you know, frequency, high frequency switchings. But the, at some point, they have to be translated into the mechanical part. And right. that's where the thing doesn't work as desired because yeah. the, the, the ideal conversion of energy somehow starts failing when the frequency starts going up. Right. And, um, and in electromechanical systems, I would also agree with you that, that yeah, nowadays you can, you can buy, in fact, I had a student, of course I gave it as a, as a course project to control the level of, of, of a water tank by means of a small bump, bump, pump. That, that was able to switch on and off, you know, hundreds of times or thousands of times per second. And they got very good performance. And mm -hmm. pump, as you say, cost $3. But, uh, you know, it, when, when, you, when you start resizing your problems and becoming more important, bigger, uh, because these this little bumps are even, you can buy them to, for a small aquarium in your house. You have these pumps. Pumping, pumping air all the time into the aquarium so the fish don't die. <laughs> but, excuse me. But uh, when you have an actual industrial pump, uh, you know, uh, pumping, pumping gasoline or oil or whatever in, in a motor, then, then the expense of a, of a valve like that, uh, when you want to do very, very fast dynamics and very fast control, Enormously, it goes enormously up. Think of the motor engine of a, of a rocket. That you know, th this pumps are fantastic pumps, but mm -hmm. they bought unless you're willing to to spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Very high quality, and they are only supposed to be working for a limited amount of time. Uh, right. so the, this is this is only this is this is one of the of the limits and boundaries of our profession. I, I absolutely agree, and for that reason, m many years ago, coming from, from PWM and slide mode control, in, in fact, act, you can actually show mathematically that they are equivalent. Um, you need an area where, where this thing doesn't require the, the discussion about justification. So the only area I found at that time Nowadays, there are more areas being open in that respect with power electronics, but only in the concern of doing purely electronic systems mm -hmm. to transfer energy from one device to another without involving mechanics. That is the part that, that I question. Right, right. If you involve, involve the mechanics, then you, you're much better off with something as possible. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for for your great lecture and uh, illuminating conversation. Uh, let's see if uh, any other questions from the audience. I'm sorry, it's uh, no, we that's are, okay. well way over two hours now. Any any questions from the audience, uh, Professor Li Hui? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Gao, and thank you, Professor Ramirez. And uh, I have a, a small question about your lecture, and uh, it's uh, on Slide eighty four. Uh, excuse me. Slide eighty four. Uh, can you say that again? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, 
I have a small question about uh, slide 84. Slide 84. Oh, okay. Yes, slide 84. And in, because that, that slide is about how to calculate U key and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the control variable, because that uh, I, I think the control variable is calculated by uh, YK plus one and YK plus two. And uh, I don't understand why. Yeah, yes, this slide. I don't understand why we can use YK plus two and YK plus one to calculate U key because uh, at time K, we cannot know uh, the YK plus one and YK plus two. So I, I can understand this equation. Thank you, Professor. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you're thinking of an implementation and, uh, and in that implementation, of course, you, you're not, you you only know yk you don't know yk plus one yk plus two that that is that is correct but this doesn't have anything to do with with uh, an actual implementation this this is a structural property this is what you want to establish is a structural property linking the input to the output and what you have is a second order system here of course this this uh, i mean I, I think it was part of the, of, of the first lecture probably the one I gave before, in which there is no, no problem with causality here, if you know how to treat this thing right. Uh, you, we will be relying on transfer functions, basically, and, and the transfer function here is causal in terms of, uh, of the, the Z transform or the Q transform, whatever you want to, to use. Uh, this will be causal. But, but the structure is, is that, and it invokes values from the future. But, but we're not, at this moment, we're not using any design. We're establishing a property, and that property buys us uh, this input-output relation, which is very, very convenient, because uh, whatever you do in, in the present will affect a two-step of, uh, of your output in the future. And, uh, and you will also have the contribution of whatever your output is now, and what the output is going to be next. But this, this is a map. This is a mathematical map. Don't, don't worry about, about the fact that these things are in the future. When you, when you want to do the control and the simulation, the, the problem disappears. It will disappear because we will be relying on, on transfer functions. And, and that, that uh, of course, the, the question is very much valid, but re remember, at this moment, what we're exploring is a structural property, and it involves the future because that's our definition. And uh, of course, you can write this. It, it doesn't mean you can measure this. And if you can write this, you can do mathematics with this. And the mathematics you do will give you extra properties of the states and other things. But this, this does, does not have any real implications as far as causality is concerned at this point. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I, I think what Professor uh, uh, mentioned or described, I don't know if it's in this course or in uh, a, a lecture back in our lab, the, the Professor Sergio Merce established that you can write the, the equation uh, in either form, either forward or backward, uh, here in a forward form, which makes the presentation easier. And uh, when you go to implementation mode, you can convert the equation back to the causal form where U is based on the past input, past output. And uh, it's just a, a mathematical formality. I think that, that's what the professor means, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, it's, thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to clarify that, yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Rafa, uh, raise his hand. Go ahead, Rafa. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello. Nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you, too. Thank you for today's lecture. Um, I don't have a question uh, per se, more, more like a comment. Uh, we had a discussion about a con possible connection between ESO and extended high gain of server. Uh, personally, I think the connection is is even um, 
closer to us than, than we initially think. Mm -hmm. uh, it became clear to me uh, when I read the paper uh, by Professor Gao and Professor Shao from 2016, uh, in which they, they proved the convergence and overall close-up stability of, AD, of ADRC using singular perturbation. And one of the key steps in that design was a parametrization using actually a parameter which they called epsilon. And epsilon was equal to one over omega. And when I read the paper, I instantly made this connection with extended high gain observers. So I think it is worth studying because I think that um, what Professor Khalil and his team are doing, they are putting this relation, epsilon, explicitly in their observer design. Whereas in works by Professor Shao, also I see similar uh, step done in works of Dr. Wen Chao Shui or Dr. Sen Chen, they, they did a similar trick in their proof, but they do it in the on the proof side, not on the design design stage. So I think this is the connection. They they arrive at the same at the same result, whereas Professor Khalil is making this modification in the design, whereas uh, the, the rest of people I mentioned they do it. Uh, when they do the proof of this of this observer without this epsilon, so so I think this is a possible way to 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 combine these two uh, types of observers, which I think they are fundamentally fundamentally related to each other. It's just a just a comment for your consideration. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Just to comment on this, yeah, I I think if you read the paper. Uh, the introduction and also in the conclusion there's a, almost a one page conclusion uh distinguishing uh this uh, uh i mean in the professor Khalil uh, paper in 2008 distinguishing uh the proposed method in that paper from professor jiang uh and uh, and his uh advisor's work from early 90s so uh uh, Professor Khalil spent a uh, uh, lot of space and uh, words trying to distinguish uh, his proposed method uh, with the previous uh, uh, work from early 90s. And uh, uh, so it's very conscientious about the, whether or not this, uh, this, uh, this method is novel very much. Unfortunately, he did not uh, cite Professor Han's work from 1995 which is uh, closer. And uh, uh, so, so if you go to the introduction and you see that uh, this work started in, in the conference paper from 2006, if I remember right, uh, CDC in December. And uh, the paper originally, I think, uh, uh, cited uh, uh, our paper uh, from 2006, ACC, which, in, which was in June. Um, that paper was a survey paper that introduced this, uh, the um, Professor Han's uh, ESO, among other observers. I think that's, that, that's, that's what the starting point uh, that leads to uh, uh, the uh, Professor Khalil's paper in late, uh, late, that, late that year in December. So there was a, a reference to Professor Han's work in the conference paper by Professor Khalil's group, but not in the journal paper. Uh, so, so that's that's unfortunate. But the back to uh, Isidori, Isidori's work from 2015, 2017, 2020 all referenced Professor Han's work in 1995. So that that's that's what's beginning. I mean, you cannot go earlier than that. That was the beginning where the uh, extended state concept. It's it's, a, it's a extending the uh, uh, the the, um, uh, the state definition to this quantity. This quantity is both of internal dynamics and also external disturbances, and that does not go earlier than Professor Han's work in 1995. So so that's the invention. That's a that's a proposed that's a proposed uh, uh, that's a newly proposed novel uh, uh, observer design. 
uh, but I give well, Professor Kirillo's full credit on, on proving it using the uh, very solid uh, mathematical uh, techniques uh, and establish the, uh, the convergence between the nominal system, like I said before, and uh, the uh, disturbed system in, in a close manner. So I think that that work was uh, very, uh, uh, we, we had a discussion last week uh, with Professor Shaw and Professor Shaw gave us a very in-depth look at how that was done, that was brilliant. So there's a lot uh, to be learned from Professor Khalil's work, but make one thing clear, the original invention belongs to Professor Han. So that's my comment on it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Any, well, any, 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 other, for... any other uh, uh, <laughs> questions? We 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 almost at uh, two and a half hour now. So. <laughs> well, many people so want to see you too. again. Yeah, we'll uh, uh, <laughs> see you next week. Next week will be lecture number six, and there will be one more lecture, right? So, so totally, there will be seven lectures. Maybe one or two. One, one or two. I'm I'm leaving I'm leaving on the eleventh. On the eleventh, I have to leave this apartment where I'm staying on the ninth, I believe. Right. Um, and uh, I, I still I think we still have some some two two more lectures or three. Or two more lectures. I think uh, twenty five uh, June twenty five and uh, July second. Okay. Or, uh, you, you, uh, you can still give another one on, Ju on July 9th if you want, but we don't hold you to it. July 9th, uh, I'll, I'll be probably moving because I'm, I'm, I'm moving to a hotel oh. uh, down the street okay. uh, on that day so that okay. they can clean up the apartment and, and I'll be, I'll be uh, uh, you know, officially live in the apartment on the tenth, so people will come to okay, okay. Furniture. I also have to to return you some furniture and some things. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Yeah, well, I I, can, I don't want to leave them here because then you will lose them. <laughs> I, I might take him, take them to the lab uh, and safely. When there I, I, is possible. I don't want to see you before you leave, though. Uh, I okay. don't. So, so that's okay. that's the makeup plan for 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 next week. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so so two more lectures, twenty five, June twenty five. That's the uh, search day next week, and uh, two weeks from the day, June, June uh, July second. Good. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Bye bye. Bye bye, Rafa. Thank you. Bye. 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 B